And Brandon, it is time to end the podcast looking at the best team from the Big Ten last year and the very best team from the Big Ten last year as they won the whole kit and caboodle with the Big Ten not only winning the Big Ten East, but also winning the Big Ten title game. And that is the Ohio State Buckeyes. And the first thing, very quickly, we're not going to harp on it for the entire preview, but we got to touch on it at the beginning. What do you think? I know that people can check out the video. It'll be above your head that people can check out. You went into detail on that's what I think with Brandon Swanson about the Urban Meyer situation. But now that we know for sure that in 14 days we are going to get an answer, what do you think is going to be the outcome of this? Will Urban Meyer be fired? Will he only be suspended? What do you think will be the outcome in two weeks? Oh, well, like I like I had mentioned on, on the, the show last week, is when everything was coming out and it, it seemed like, you know, we got we got pieces and then it was uh he didn't know anything about it. Then he came out and he said, No, I did know about it and I, I reported it to who I needed to report it to. Mm-hmm. So there's a there's a book out there. It's by Tim Tebow and it's called Through My Eyes. It's a really good book. I'm reading it right now and it talks about, you know, some of the stuff that uh, you know he went through just throughout his entire life and then his kind of relationship with Urban Meyer and Urban as a person and a coach. And mm-hmm. Urban Meyer seems like a very stand up gentleman mm-hmm. um, of a person. And and I truly believe that. And I would like to think that he did report what he needed to report, especially if he said he did. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I just wasn't I just wasn't sold on that. He did it. Because we haven't found out for sure if he did it. And then mm-hmm. if he did report it, who did he report it to? Did he go so as far to report it to the to the court to the Title IX coordinator? Mm-hmm. Or did he just report it to the athletic director? And some would say, hey, if he, if he just said something to the athletic director, he's done. I don't think I I don't think I would say that. And I don't think that you could say that as as the as the head coach either. Mm-hmm. I don't think that you would want, and some people will say, "Well, he's a head coach; he shouldn't have to deal with that stuff." Well, sorry, um, it's it's life, and mm-hmm. it, it could be someone whose you know life is I don't want to say hanging in the balance, but has been terribly affected by something poor in yeah. their life. And if you're able to stop it, then then you can do that. Mm-hmm. But I had said that I in the show I had said that I didn't believe that Urban Meyer would be back if indeed they found out that he didn't report it or if. It was only if it was only reported in one way, then if it was only reported to a certain person, he should have gone farther. He'll stay, but there could be a suspension. But if he didn't report it at all, he, he I mean he can't he can't come back. He won't be he won't be back to the to the university. And and the best case scenario is that they find everything. Mm-hmm. They find that he did what he needed to do, and he's back out, um, you know, coaching football, and this whole thing's behind us. Well, and from what I've heard today, David Pollock was on the Dan Patrick show this morning, and when he was asked about it, he said he thinks that Urban's going to get two game suspension, two game suspension, which would mean. Oregon State, Rutgers, he's not there. He'll be back on the sideline September 15th against TCU. Also, on Friday, Dan Patrick asked Pat Ford of Yahoo Sports what he thinks. Do you think Urban Meyer is going to get fired? And he said, you know what? I just don't know. I don't have enough. There's not enough here to make a decision. He goes, my gut reaction is that he does not get fired. So that's two people in this football atmosphere that are already leaning towards David Pollock gave a clear answer. Pat Ford did not, but both of them basically saying he's not going to get fired. And, but I just want to jump in there really quickly is, is to go along with the Mm -hmm. report that Brett McMurphy Mm -hmm. had put out. He interviewed anonymously 16 athletic directors. And they said there's, they don't see a chance of how he gets out of this. Yeah. And they didn't, they didn't believe again with what Mm -hmm. they're hearing on Thursday of last week, Mm-hmm. Of and everything that they've well, heard and everything that they've seen, how does he get out of it? And possibly, how does the AD or the president get out of and, it? And and that's like one of the things that did not come out 
before your video did because we recorded your video on Friday. On Saturday, the same day your video posted, an interview with Zach Smith on ESPN posted. And I played the interview for you because I listened to it this morning. And this was kind of my first takes of it was, first off, very first off, the first thought I had was two weeks, they're going to do this investigation, innocent until proven guilty, where... What it because he kept saying self defense, self defense, self defense. So, part of me in my mind is although I don't believe it, all right, innocent until proven guilty. We have seen cases where you know, like guys are attacked just as well. However, I was like already forming my opinion, and two things that just didn't sit well was the first part of the interview they showed kind of made me think like. All right, this was Ohio State and Urban Meyer basically saying, you got to go out there and basically say something. Because he made a sure fact that he told Urban Meyer and that he made a fact to say, yeah, Urban looked at me and he said, Zach, if you hit her, you're fired. Just know that. If it comes out and you touched her, you're fired. Which I was like, all right, like I could see Urban saying that, but it kind of seemed a little bit of like, you're really trying to get this point across to make Urban Meyer seem like that good guy that many people thought he like thought he was before the whole misunderstand the lying at the media day and everything we're at right now. The second thing that didn't sit well with me is and the only thing I wished is I don't know who the interviewer was for the ESPN um interview because I've never seen the guy before. Um but when Zach Smith was talking about what he was doing. Cause the interviewer asked, well, you said like, how would you basically self-defense? He goes like, Oh, I'm basically like put my hands out to kind of move her just so I can get like through the door and away from it because I didn't want to hurt her. And the interviewer, I wish he would have pressed more at this because it was so inconsistent to where he said, but how does putting your hands out, create the bruises that were in the pictures that are available. And the answer that didn't sit well with me, and there was a there was a little smile, which to me, I'm like, why the hell are you smiling? Is he, he tried to answer, kind of stumbled on his answer, and then went, well, you, you just had to be there. And I'm like, that is not the answer you give. That is not the answer you give right now. Well, I'm glad I wasn't. I'm glad I wasn't, but it's like, it just didn't make sense of, like his answer to where I'm like, all right, I know I said the innocent until proven guilty. That's part of my mind. But the other 99.9% of my mind is like, this guy is talking like an abuser. He's talking like a guy who did it, who just doesn't want to. Oh, that was the other thing where he goes, um, they go, so you told Urban? He goes, yeah. Well, why didn't you tell him about everything else that was going on? And he goes, I didn't think he needed to know. And then they asked him about, should Urban Meyer have investigated? And he goes, no, he's a football coach. Why should he have to do that? And my first thought was, if you didn't do it, you got nothing. To, like, it's very basic. If you didn't do it, you got nothing to hide. You, the only way you don't want someone to look into it is if you got something to hide. And that, to me, is with that whole interview, why it just didn't sit right with me. And mm -hmm. I feel like... What is going to happen at the end of this is that Zach Smith will be fired. They will say Urban Meyer did enough, and he'll get like Pollock is saying maybe Z a suspension. Zach and he'll Smith stay was on. Zach Smith was well, fired. He, yeah, he like, was he's fired. He's gone. Yes. Um, and then I feel like I don't feel at this point, based off of what I heard from like actual analysts in the field, I think it's I don't know if it's a two game like Pollock said today. But I have a feeling that, you know, if they're saying that he's not going to get fired, that anything can happen, but it'll probably be a suspension. Maybe at most a four-game suspension, he's back by Big Ten time. The, the biggest thing that they need to find out is if he indeed mm -hmm. did report it, who did he report it to? How yep. is it reported? Because if he did indeed report it, I think you can look at job is mm -hmm. him be getting fired is out of the question. Mm -hmm. He will not be fired. Yeah. 
but who did you report it to mm-hmm. and how is it reported? What it will be is it will be a learnable moment for how we're supposed to go through proper channels. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't just get a slap on the wrist. But basically, but, but you, is that but what it's going to be? But he may be given a suspension, mm-hmm. maybe, for, for a couple of games or anything yeah. like that. And I don't, I don't think that that's a bad thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, any game where you can't be coaching your team mm-hmm. is not good. Mm-hmm. But if if he did do what he believed was to was was right and and how he was supposed to do it, then you know you just need to show and and, and there will be you know you need to have uh, we need to have this uh, session we ha- need to have this training this training you have to go through all of these mm-hmm. and your wife has to as well because she was included in the text messages and yeah all this stuff which again you pull in. All of this stuff, and it would mm-hmm. kind of really muddies the waters. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, all Ohio State really wants to get back to is being able to allow, hopefully, for them, Urban Meyer, to be coaching this team. Well, I thought you were going to say a simpler thing, and I was going to segue it in. I thought you were going to say they just want to get back to football. They, they, Let's... they, they do. But at the mm-hmm. same time, I don't want to be so insensitive to. Well, they don't really care about the people. They just want to. They just want to win football. Well, I games. mean, they just want to get back to having people talk about the football team and not about a situation or a scandal about the team. And that's where we're going to kind of segue into the football team because this is a preview for their year, there's two things I've been debating in my head of what I wanted to start off with. The first one is the quarterback situation, but I feel like I go to the offense way too much. So we're going to start with the defense. I'm going to ask you this. Nick Bosa, he is a guy that many mock drafts, many big boards have him 1-2 on their big board. I'm going to ask you this just plain and simple, not beating around the bush. How special is little Bosa going to be this year? He's going to be... (laughs) <laughs> he's going to be really special. This is going to be a guy that will anchor this defense. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that you you have to be pretty excited about what he what he brings to the table. And again, this is a, this is a defense that usually, I mean with with Ohio State you look at both sides that are, you know, really good. He just he just brings an energy. Mm-hmm. I mean, clearly, we, we, we know that with, you know, Big, big yeah. Bosa. But well, the um, only thing it's... I'm thinking is too bad the Chargers won't suck enough to draft him. And we could see Bosa Bosa on the um, defensive side for the L.A. Chargers. I just, I think that you look at, you look at this Ohio State team and, 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 and where the concern may come in is kind of the back end. Mm-hmm. Bosa and, and, and his group up front are going to be explosive they're going to cause a lot of havoc in the backfield for uh, opposing quarterbacks Mm -hmm. it's going they're going to put on tons of pressure and they're going to make it tough but in in the in the back you look at kind of linebacker you look at linebacker is where that that's something where you you maybe draw a little bit of a question mark uh, on there and, and and say that these guys while yes athletic what do you, one do you have depth there you have guys coming back from injury that's that's the question there mm-hmm. and and then you go past that and you go into the secondary and then you're looking at another pretty strong unit well let's jump then to the offensive side of the ball and the biggest question i think for this football team is how do you replace JT Barrett and we talked about Ohio State football earlier this offseason when Joe Burrow decided to transfer from this team and decided to go to the LSU Tigers. The clear number one now is Dwayne. Right now it's either Dwayne Haskin or Tate Martell. It looks like Haskin is the clear number one to be the starting quarterback for the Buckeyes. He's a guy that's got a cannon for a right arm. Well, like a laser cannon for a right arm. And he has some heroic in him. He showed some uh, heroics in the Michigan game last year. If they go, let's say Haskins Haskins is the number one guy and he wins the starting job this offseason. Is he the next kind of addition in this Buckeye lineage of quarterbacks where it's been, you know, you had Miller, then you had Cardell, then you had Miller and JT, then you had JT, 
is Haskin the next one just to keep this this quarterback line moving for the Buckeyes? I think that he will certainly be good. He's got a great arm. Mm-hmm. One thing that he'll have to, I don't want to say which remains to be seen, but but Ohio State will be looking for him to run the offense uh, you know, more smoothly, mm-hmm. and they want to be able to see that he's comfortable doing zone reads mm-hmm. and that he's effective at doing it. Yeah. Um, and and uh, that they're not seeing broken plays because he's unable to do it. So mm-hmm. those are two things that I think they'll want to watch out for, but everything else is there. Everything else is there. Again, uh, especially that, that arm strength. Mm-hmm. That he's got, and and I don't want to say that the off that the Ohio State quarterback job is like a a rotating, not a rotating, but just one guy in, he stays his years, he's good, out. Next guy's in, he stays his years, <laughs> like out. an assembly line. Yeah, exactly, a quarterback and I, assembly line. And I don't want to say that because each one brings a different dy- dynamic and dimension to their game, mm-hmm. but they've all been good. Yeah, they've all been for the. I mean, for the last couple of years, and especially when you have one that stays for multiple years, and they've been good since the beginning. You look at that, and, and you and you really have to feel fortunate, and and I think that sometimes fans, especially Ohio State fans, you know, you've been spoiled, um, but but you're not used to anything less. I mean, that's what you expect. You expect your teams to be consistently good, and you should. But uh, now, now with JT Barrett gone, and you. You you have Haskins coming in. It's it's going to be interesting to see how things might be any different with him in there running it than what it you know you'll be interested to see the differences between what J T Barrett had, what Haskins has, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and kind of go from there and and see okay, do we feel like going forward we're going to be really comfortable with this guy or mm, we may uh, we may see ourselves in a little bit of a quarterback competition. Well, the thing I find funny is you say quarterback assembly line, and I'm just going to tell you, I'm going back a decade. This is the last decade of Ohio State quarterbacks, and I'm going to tell you the starting quarterback that year and the record they had. You ready for this little history lesson? 2008, Terrell Pryor, I believe that was his freshman year, um, they just went ten and three that year. No big deal. Um, twenty nineteen or twenty twenty nineteen. So next year, this is who they've got. Two thousand and nine. Terrell Pryor again. They go eleven and two. Um, the next year, twenty ten. I believe it was Terrell Pryor again. These wins were vacated, but they still went twelve and one that year, even though um, those wins were vacated. So still a really good record. With Terrell Pryor. Then 2011, that was the first year that we had Braxton Miller as the quarterback. They went 6-7. and seven. So a down year for the Buckeyes in 2011. Miller stays the quarterback. They go 12-0 and all that year. Um, then they that was when they were ineligible for the playoffs or anything. Um, then in 2013, still Miller. They go 12-2. and two. Um, losing the Orange Bowl by five points to the Clemson Tigers. Then 2014, that was the JT Barrett as the starter with Cardell Jones kind of getting some snaps. 2014, they win the they national championship. Yep. That was the year that Cardell kind of took the starting job late in the year. They go 14-1 and one overall. Then in 2015, it's Cardell Jones again. They go 12-1 and one that year. Then 2016, where it's JT Barrett show, and they go 11 and two, and then last year they go 12 and two with JT Barrett and Dwayne Haskins a little bit. So really, you say it's been an assembly line literally from 2000, the last decade. Terrell Pryor, Braxton Miller, Cardell Jones, JT Barrett, now Dwayne Haskins. It's been four quarterbacks going on the fifth one, and we'll see if he can kind of continue. That really, it was Braxton Miller's first year before Urban Meyer came in, where they went six and seven. I was gonna say, so the pressure is on Haskins. You, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, he's got a standard to live up to. Yep. And it's, I mean, it's clearly been set, and you don't want to be the guy to be any worse than that. So and, I, I think that you know, there's, there's, I don't want to say that there's some pressure riding there, mm-hmm. but it's certainly got to be in the back of his mind that hey, there's a standard. 
I've got to meet it. Well, and for me, the big the the two big guys I'm looking at. One, I was all over him coming into last year. I think he's a phenomenal offensive weapon. Did you get and on that's him? uh that's no, I'm still on him. Paris Campbell. Like I love this dude. We're basically yeah, he's not like a guy that's gonna be in a thousand yard receiver. He only had about five eighty four last year. Dude's got speed. Dude is quick. Dude can Dude, dude can. I basically, dude like, can do a lot. I could see him being, like, if he develops right and in the NFL develops right, could be like a um, Tyreek Hill kind of a guy with the speed that he has, like being that kind of a receiver at the next level. The other guy that, I mean, I cannot wait. I think that it'll be it'll be him, and I'm blanking on the name, the, the running back that will be, at the um with the Badgers this year. It's going to be J JK Dobbins who is going to be one of the best running backs. Like Saquon Barkley was the best back last year. Dobbins might take that over this year and could be the best back we see in the Big 10 this year. Those will be the two guys that I am really excited about that if they play well, that'll take all that pressure off of Haskins, because he'll have a running back that can do it all, who had almost 1,500 yards last year, who averaged about just over seven yards a pop as a freshman a year ago. And Paris Campbell, he'll fly all over the field just waiting for Haskins to drop him passes all day. So those are two guys that I'm looking at that it's like, yes, if those guys can play well, then you add in a guy like K.J. Hill, I think this Buckeye this Buckeye team is going to be fine this year, even if they lose Urban for about two to four games at the beginning of the year. Johnny Dixon, mm-hmm. wide receiver, eighteen catches mm-hmm. on the year. He had eight touchdowns. Yeah, eighteen catches, eight TDs. Mm-hmm. Uh, so again, it's it's what what Ohio State always has is effectiveness, and they're efficient with what they they've just have got. Talent. They're, they're, they're so efficient. The it doesn't matter. You, oh, uh, that guy only got 12 passes. He had 11 touchdowns. You know, I mean, that's just that's just how it feels with Ohio State. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, it's a it's a it's a like math. It's like a plug and chug. You mm-hmm. know, it's they they take out guys. They put new ones in and they all seem to be outstanding. And that's why, again, no one would be surprised if people are picking them to win the East yep. and picking them to win the conference. I'll say it right now. This is a team that will most likely go undefeated this year and play Wisconsin for the Big Ten title again. Like The thing I look at, you look at the teams they lost to last year. A like Penn State could get them. I'm not going to say that's going to be an easy win for them. Duh, it's not. I know that's going to be a dogfight. But like... Y- they lost the Iowa game because they were coming off of a highly exciting win against Penn State. They're not going to let that happen again. Like, Penn State, they're not going to lose to Indiana at home. Like, the Iowa game compounded because they were playing on the road. This year, the Penn State game's on the road. Then they have two games at home. Also, you look at the teams that they're playing from the other side of the of the Big Ten. Minnesota, which should be a win. Purdue on the road, yeah, Purdue might be tough, but I'm still giving that to the Buckeyes. And then Nebraska. I would say it's a trap game if it was in Lincoln. It's in Columbus. It should be a win. As long as this team takes care of business against Penn State, takes care of business against Michigan State, which those two teams, they are at East Lansing. They are at Happy Valley, so it's going to be a little bit harder than last year. And then takes care of business last game of the year against rival Michigan. I see this team basically being a team that could win every game because, I'll be honest, TCU fans will get mad. I like this team better against TCU on a neutral site than I did last year against OU. I mean, that OU team was a special OU team. Yeah, TCU is going to be good. However, that TCU team this year is nothing where that Oklahoma team was last year. And is it weird that I like Ohio State against TCU on a neutral site this year more than I liked them against Ohio or like them against Oklahoma in Columbus last year? Like usually you'd be like, oh, the neutral site game, like you don't get that home field advantage. 
I like them better here than I did last year, and it was a home game for them. I think you look at the schedule for the Buckeyes. They they win their first four. They beat Indiana, Minnesota, Purdue, Nebraska, Maryland, Michigan. And the two games that I look at, and I know people will call me crazy because last year they blew mm-hmm. Michigan State out of the water 48-3. Mm-hmm. It was not even. It's going to be a closer game, maybe, because it's on the road. <laughs> it's going to be a closer game, comma. Well, Maybe. I, I mean, it could um, it could still be a blow on. I'm not I'm not taking that out of the equation. And that and that's and that's still with this defense that mm-hmm. Michigan State was was boasting last yep. year. They just didn't show up for that one. I mean, it's Penn, at home this year, Penn, so it could Penn be State easier to get. And up. Michigan State are the two games on this schedule that I look at mm-hmm. for Ohio State and the Buckeyes, and I go, those are going to be two tests. They're both going to be difficult games, and if Ohio State wins both of those games, mm-hmm. they they will go undefeated. So are you completely discounting the Michigan-Ohio State game? Are you discounting yes. it and saying it's going to be Ohio State by a long run? Yes. Wow, really? Yes. Really? Yes. I'm throwing it in there. I'm throwing it go in there. Go ahead. The, the reason why I throw it in there is because of what we talked about in the Michigan preview is, one— they probably have the best quarterback that they have since Jim Harbaugh had Jake Rudolph. Number Rudak. two, Rudolph. Um, number two, I was thinking Mason Rudolph in my head. Um, number two, you think Jim Har? I think Jim Harbaugh is going to get these get these guys remembering. Hey, remember twenty? Like you guys were here. Remember? Uh, remember twenty sixteen? Remember what happened in uh, Columbus twenty sixteen? How we should have had them. We did have them. We got screwed in that game. Get the boys going. I think that's going to be a closer game this year. I'm not necessarily saying Michigan wins it hands down, but basically saying, hey, you know what? Let's get the boys going. It's going to be as close of a game as it was in 2016, not like what we saw last year or in 2015. Michigan's defense, while, yes, they're Mm -hmm. very good, they will be very good, Mm -hmm. Ohio State is at home. Mm Mm-hmm. And there's so many weapons. Yeah. We went through a number of mm-hmm. them. Michigan cannot contain them all. Oh, that's why I'm, like I said, it's going to be, to me, I'm thinking the offense will be better. That's why I'm saying it's going to be closer to a, Ohio State's going to get their 30 points. I ain't saying that they're going to be under 30 points. Like, you look at since Jim Harbaugh's got there, Ohio State's gotten 42, 30, and 31 against Michigan. They're going to get their 30 points. But I don't see this Michigan team being a 13, a 20-point team. I see them being a 27 or above point team. That's why I said closer to that 30 to 27 game like it was in 2016. I think that you're 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 correct in in what you're saying in terms of what 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 you're not necessarily in just what you're saying, but what you're thinking, what you're thinking in terms of of this has been a close game in the past. We've seen it be a close game, and it's the last game of the season. And that also has adrenaline and emotions and everything like that. Mm-hmm. But still, I I'm I'm very high on Ohio State. I like what I see on the on the roster. I think Michigan's going to be much improved from where they were last year, but I don't think that they're gonna be at the point where I don't I'm not saying this is going to be a blowout game, but I don't think we're going to be seeing some double overtime 30-27 score. I'm going to ask you this really quick, a little uh college football history for you. Do you know off the top of your head the last year that Michigan beat Ohio State in this rivalry? I don't know off the top of my head. I will give you a hint. You were I want uh, I want to say you were a junior in high school. Could you graduate high school in 2012, right? No. All right. 2011 yeah. was basically when it was. Um, do you know – we know who the starting quarterback for the Buckeyes was because I named all of them, uh, Brack, Brackton Miller. Do you remember who the starting quarterback was for the Michigan State Wolverines that year? The Michigan State Wolverines? Or not Michigan State, Michigan Wolverines. It's been a long podcast. No, I don't. He had the nickname Shoelace. He got drafted by the Jaguars. 
Or the G- yeah, the Jaguars. Because I, I keep saying that wrong. It's not Jaguars, it's Jaguars. He got drafted by the Jaguars. Just tell me. Denard Robinson. Shoelace. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. We weren't close, he, he, so I didn't he know. Was the, uh, he was the quarterback, the dual threat quarterback that eventually disappeared. changed to a wide receiver. That event, the eventually disappeared in the um, next level. But yeah, that is the last time that Michigan State has won. So let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. So if we're going off of history... Ohio State will win this year. Next year, Michigan will win. Because it's been 2003, Michigan won. Seven wins for Ohio State. That seventh one gets vacated. Michigan wins. And then right now we're on a six-game win streak for Ohio State. Basically, ever since Urban Meyer's been there, I think, it's been Ohio State over Michigan. But I think that one is a tougher. I'm going to throw that into the Penn State, Michigan State games that you were talking about. Any final thoughts about the Buckeyes before we uh, tie or end everything up? They're an exciting-looking team again this season, even with no JT Barrett at the helm. You just got to hope, if you're a an Ohio State Buckeye fan, that this investigation uh, within two weeks, 14 days, is wrapped up, is done, and uh, you know, a, a, an outcome where you keep your head coach. A little fun fact to end the podcast. Ever since the new millennium, or Willennium, um, Michigan has only beaten Ohio State three times. 2000, 2003, 2011. It's been all Buckeyes ever since. This is where you guys come in. Let us know what you think down below in the comment section. What do you think about Ohio State this year, about Haskins, the offense, the defense, how great is this team going to be this year, and also about the Urban Meyer situation going on right now. Also, If you're on Blog Talk Radio, iTunes, Stitcher, any podcast services around the world, make sure to tell us what you thought about anything we talked about today. Make sure to check out Patreon.com to check out how to support the channel more so than watching and listening. Make sure to grab yourself an MVP t-shirt down below in the description or at mostvalopodcast.com where you can get your MVP each and every day. And last but not least, if you're on on Apple Podcasts, you have iTunes, make sure to give the Primetime Podcast a five-star rating. It means the world to us. And also type in a little something-something. We are not a couple of good old boys. We talk more than the SEC. I will bring it up. You say this every time. I will bring it up until somebody gives us any review, like any review, because we're not good old boys. We don't just talk SEC. We just talked for about two and a half hours to three hours, I want to say, on the Big Ten. But thank you guys for watching on YouTube. Thank you guys for listening on podcast services around the world. And as always, have a good day, everybody. 